Okay, so we looked at the first five commandments. God is, and he's the only one. Everything else we worship or draw life from is an idol. An idol is always made out of something God has already made. <laughs> so it's not wrong to want to be married, but if you have to be married to, be, to, be, to have life, to have value, then it's an idol. God created marriage, but life doesn't come from marriage. And if yours does, it means you don't have a life. That's a serious thought, isn't it? nothing wrong with wanting to go to a particular country as a missionary, but if you have to go there to add meaning to your life, then you've made it an idol. So pagan idols are made of wood and gold and silver, and who made the wood and the gold and the silver? Well, God did. Uh, worshiping the sun is worshiping something that God made. So God is trying to give us reality. In this first commandment, I, I'm it. I made it all. I know how it works. I made you. I know how you work. I have nothing but gentle and kind thoughts towards you. Don't waste your life is basically what God is saying. Don't waste your life worshiping things that can't add, well, if we use a business phrase, add value. Philosophically, add meaning. 21st century gibberish make you happy. <laughs> okay, so whenever we move away from this, we're moving towards idolatry or deception. Okay, and one of the ways we can test that is by looking for idols in our life. And if you ask God to help you do this, he will do this. And it's a lifelong process. It's not that once, you know, I, idols is such a big word. And it's the word God uses because it is very, very big to him. But idols can look very, like very small things to us. So I can remember um, reading a book see if I can remember the name as I go along here. Uh, and it said, sin is anything that, that adds value to your life apart from God. <laughs> That's the essence of sin. Because in God, you have all the value you are ever going to get. And it's, it, you are second in the universe only to him in value. Everything else is living out that value. Okay, so I started to say, okay, God, what gives me value? What do I think, what makes me feel better on a daily basis? And I can remember I was, I'm in my 30s somewhere, and I'm traveling probably eight months out of the year, and I'm walking through the airport, and, and I've got my briefcase with all my travel tags on it, you know, just the end of the stub, because it's so cool to have like 30 plastic bands with stubs on them, because that's his real big traveler. And I picked up my briefcase, and the Lord said, is it, is it travel? Is that why you feel good about what you're doing? Is it because you're traveling? You can walk around with your little tags on your briefcase and go, ha, ha, ha. I thought, oh. Took all the tags off my briefcase. And another day, I got up and looked in the mirror, and, and uh, and I was satisfied with what I saw, which is very rare. <laughs> and the Lord said, is that it? Is that it? Because you look the way you want to look? Is that what, is that what gives you value today? Is that what makes you feel OK? Because, because that's the right blouse or the right, you finally have a good haircut? Or, and I thought, gosh, yes. And on days when I don't look as good as I think I should, I feel worse. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to look good, to do your best with what you've got to work with. 
But when it becomes a source of life to you, it's become an idol. So I recommend you, you begin this journey of the lifestyle of killing idols in your life because they, there are different idols for different seasons. And you'll find new ones later on. And then God says that the next thing you need to do if you want to know if you believe number one is, is, is listen to your words. Again, when I was younger, um, I've been in the mission for 40 years, so I have a long history. Joy Dawson said to a group of us one time, you can talk all day about, about missions. How long can you talk about God? Oh, that went clear through me. That was the smoothest arrow through my heart I have ever felt just oh, and I was damaged from that moment on I, I thought oh my gosh we listen to us listen to us we're excited about a project we're excited about a strategy we're excited about you know anything but God <laughs> And we sort of assume God into the conversation, but he isn't the topic. We, we can make an idol out of strategy. So I began to ask God to, to help me talk about him. Because ultimately, there is no value to this work if it isn't about him. And lo and behold, that's all I do now. <laughs> I guess the prayer was answered. I, I'm not terribly interested to talk to you about business, but I'm very interested to talk to you about God, use of business. Who God is in business. Um, because that's something that will serve you for all of eternity. Okay, then God switches to us. And he says, keep my Sabbath. And we said that the Sabbath has to be defined initially by Genesis 1 and 2. You can't define the Sabbath only by passages from the New Testament or later on in the Kings or David. You have to take it from Genesis 1 and 2 and then build on it because that's the first Sabbath. God celebrates a Sabbath. So it has nothing to do with food or being tired. Because God doesn't need more food or rest. He's not tired. It has to do with something essential to our being. Not something we need, but something that must be expressed. Because of who we are. So God doesn't need anything from the Sabbath. The Sabbath expresses something about him. And so what he is doing on the first Sabbath is looking at what he has done in the past. <laughs> Sorry. That's only funny for certain people with certain theologies. The first six days, he's looking at it and he's enjoying the completion of it. It's done, and it's good. You know, when you work with people all the time, it's, it's really hard to evaluate your work. So I, I love to do things with my hands, so paint a room or anything. So then I can look at it and go, it's finished. And sometimes I can say, it's good, <laughs> or pretty good. Or my dad really wouldn't have been very proud of that. <laughs> but I can evaluate it. And this is part of God likeness. To take time to savor the phenomenal thing it is to be able to create. Now, we, when we think of creativity, we think of paintings and dance and 
uh, statues. Well, God's definition of creativity goes beyond that. In fact, human beings are created in the image of God, which means you don't do anything that isn't creative. Uh, you can go to jail for creative accounting. <laughs> but everything is creative. Human beings are creative. You cannot not create. You just don't necessarily create through paint or through movement or through music. But you, you have to create. And, and you have been doing something with that creative ability all week long. And unsavored creativity dries up the soul. Unappreciated un, uh, work. Not, you don't need to, other people to appreciate your work. You need to appreciate your work. A Sabbath is not for everybody to, to tell you what a good job you did this last week. The Sabbath is for you to stop and with God contemplate the last six days and enjoy God through you. If you hate your work, you can't really have a Sabbath. You can have a solemn assembly where you <laughs> repent. <laughs> if you can't work, for those who are disenfranchised from work, a, a Sabbath has no meaning. Why? Because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday had no meaning. It's a celebration of the right to work. Work is not a privilege. Work is the purpose for which we as human beings are created in the image of God, and it's a right. An economy that leaves out huge portions of its population from, from the workforce is not only going to be a poor economy, it's an immoral economy. When unemployment is increasing, we are going backwards from the kingdom of God. When unemployment is decreasing, we're going forward. Very simple. It's very quantitative. You can't be pro-life and anti-jobs. Because people can't live if they can't earn. And so you can take this this one Sabbath, and you can stretch it out. You, if you work, but you're in slavery, and you can't earn enough to feed your family on the Sabbath, then how can you celebrate the six days of your work? And of course, slavery says your work has no value. If your work has no value, you'd have no value. If you have no value, then God isn't real. And the truth is not what he says it is. So we have to go back to number one. Okay, and then he says, honor your mother and father. And mothers and fathers all over the world think this means to obey them. But it has nothing to do with obeying your mother and father. That's a different subject. Honoring your mother and father means to honor the source of your life. So otherwise, regardless of your origins, and those particulars in your life that you had no control over, who you were born to, where you were born, the class you were born into, regardless, if you had the two worst parents in the world, your child of rape, you were a test tube baby. You were a frozen sperm donor. Regardless, whoever gave that sperm, whoever produced that egg, gave you life. 
and your life is sacred. Your life is a gift of God. The sperm and the egg may have come from terrible people, but life came from God, and he used those terrible people to bring it into existence. Okay, now we shift to our neighbor. So you see the parallel, love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. The formula is just in a different order here. The, the terrible thing is you will love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's the terrible news. So if you do not love yourself, you're going to have a real hard time helping your neighbor. And in, in our age, uh, young people talk about loving themselves. I, I, they're, looking, they're looking for an emotional response to themselves, you know. They're looking to look in the mirror and go, oh, you're just such a wonderful person. I love you. And, of course, this is not what God's talking about. Emotions come and go. Sometimes because of the weather, sometimes because of the cycle in your body. They, they, you know, they have, a, they have a life all their own. Who knows why they come and go, but they do. We only control how we respond to them. We don't stir them up. But I ask young people, well, did you, did you eat this morning? Yes. Well, then you love yourself. Did you sleep in the bed last night or did you go out and sleep on the street? No, I slept in the bed. Well, you love yourself. Did you get up this morning and, and wash or have you just gone filthy for the last 60 days? No, I took a shower. Okay, you love yourself. See, because love is very pragmatic. And the pragmatic choice, to make the right choice, may sometimes lead to the emotion, but the emotion is what it is. It's a trailer. It doesn't take you anywhere. It's not the truck. And so when you feel good about yourself, that's a nice day, but it's not going to happen that often. But you take care of yourself, and by that I mean you feed yourself. If you're sick, you go to the doctor. If you're, w w finally you go to bed, even if you're one of those night people. You know, you get sleep, you make sure you have clothes, you love yourself, because this is loving yourself. You are sustaining your life. And when God says, love your neighbor as yourself, that's part of what he means. Did he get to eat today? Can he eat every day? Where is he sleeping? Can he get to a doctor when he has a problem? And, and so the, the, the problem of loving the world comes right down to that very concrete, pragmatic level. I don't have to have an emotional response to it. Every African I come across in the African continent go, oh, I love you. Um, I think that would be neurotic, diagnosably neurotic. I have to care for them like I care for myself. And, and if I care for them like I care for myself, I will be asking, what could I do? There'll be a lot of things I can't do. There are a lot of things I can't do about my own circumstances. But I'm always asking, God, what could I do here? I'm not going to get younger. I'm progressively going to get older. So I can't change that. But are there ways I can sort of keep the energy going a little better? And that's what God wants for us, for our neighbor and those who are around us, is, is there something I could do? And often the answer is no. But often the answer is yes. And that is loving your neighbor. Okay, so when we shift to the neighbor, this should be much easier for you now. Because 
I've already given you all the answers. Now you just have to apply them to your neighbor. Okay? So thou shalt not murder. And the translation is murder, not kill. So if your translation has kill, that's a poor translation in the English. The Hebrew is murder. There's a difference between killing and murdering. Killing you cannot avoid. Murder you can. Okay, so what is God trying to give us, you and me, when he says, thou shalt not murder? I don't know why, but when I go to the Ten Commandments, I always do the King James. So weird. I haven't read the King James since I was 15 years old. It's stuck in there. What's he trying to give us? I know he wants us not to murder our neighbor, but that's the, that's the pragmatic level what does it mean? What is the meaning God is trying to convey to us? What is the value God is trying to convey to us? If I, if I murder my neighbor, that means I'm allowing him, therefore I will love me. Okay, very good, very good. If I, if I can kill you, if I can murder you, I don't believe you have any value. If I don't believe you have any value, I don't believe value comes from God. Therefore, I don't believe I have any value either. <laughs> so we have to go back to number one. See, everything takes us back to number one. Do you believe God or do you not? If you believe God and who he is, you will act and, and make decisions in a particular way. If you, if you don't, then there's something about God you're missing or denying or rejecting. So, so you don't have to be nice for me to believe that your life is sacred. You don't even have to be Christian. You can be a Muslim terrorist in Guantanamo Bay. And I am required by God to be as concerned for the justice you get as I am for the justice I get. Why? Because you're a nice person? No, because you're a human being. And this is what it means to fight on behalf of your enemy. Now, if you're guilty... I believe you should get justice, but I think I should get justice if I'm guilty too. But I should be concerned that the process for you is as good a justice as I would want the United States government to give myself. And I should be appalled and, and, and angry and proactive to make sure that's happening. Now, you know, if I say this in Christian circles in the United States, I sound like a terrorist. See, because we actually do believe value is based on being a good guy or a bad guy. <laughs> but it isn't. It's based on being human. Created in the image of God. Okay, now we've all got types of people, groups of people, I like to say it this way, that get up our nose. You know, you ever had a Mosquito go up your nose. That's so annoying. So annoying. There are people that get up our nose. Sometimes they're a group of people, a tribe or a culture. Sometimes they're just a, a type. Loving them doesn't mean liking them. Loving your spouse doesn't even mean liking them today. Everybody has likable days and unlikable days. But loving them means I believe they are created in the image of God and they have all the rights that God has given me. 
And in spite of the fact that I disagree with them or even dislike them immensely or even would call them an enemy, there is a certain protocol of integrity I will require of myself towards them and of my government towards them simply because they're human. So Jesus talks in a way that would make you think we actually pursue the ones that are in that category for us. So it, it, Jesus begins to minister and he makes a beeline for the Samaritans. <laughs> now, nobody's worse to the Jews than the Samaritans. They don't even want Samaritan dust on their shoes. And he takes 12 Jews with him. I, I just would love to hear something written about the conversation between the 12 Jewish boys and Jesus at the border of Samaria. You know, because here's the Messiah saying, I'm going in, and here's the 12 Jew Jewish boys with a lifetime of you never go there. That's the bad place. That's where the bad people live. We don't go there. That's the bad street. That's the other neighborhood. We don't, and Jesus is going straight in. Okay, so if my life has value, your life has value. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now this again is a funny one for me. Uh, sometimes in scripture when it says adultery, it means sex between at least one party that's already married, if not two. Sometimes in the scriptures it means all sexual sin. In this case, it's all sexual sin. Do not commit adultery. You know, because we just kind of go, well, it happens. Murder, we're still a little bit more aware that, yeah, that's not, that, that's, murder is deadly. <laughs> we, can, we can see that. We can embrace that. Okay, surely it can't be good if people die prematurely. Well, we get to adultery and we go, well, this is a big drop from importance isn't it? Got all this great religious stuff, God only, idols, his name, Sabbath, mother and father, murder, those all make sense. And then adultery, it was, <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of old. You know, maybe we should add it to 10, maybe it should be 9. Maybe God lost his train of thought. Maybe he forgot how fun he made it. But you see, we're, we're looking at our experience of sexuality rather than the consequences. My generation has to bear responsibility for perpetrating the idea that you could have sex without consequences. We invented it. We have to own it. As long as it's two um, consenting adults, it doesn't hurt anybody. Okay, and since birth control, you don't even have to deal with that problem. And uh, use condoms, you won't get any venereal disease. And, and we perpetuate this myth. My age group and the next two generations after me, when you, when, you, <laughs> when you talk to people all over the world, that is their mindset. I mean, my gosh, we did evangelize the world with this message. There's nowhere in the world. They don't have this concept, except maybe in the middle of the Amazon jungle. But they have their own sexual issues in the middle of the jungle. It just doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. It is killing more human beings than any idea in the history of the human race. This makes Stalin look like a good guy. This makes the Khmer Rouge look merciful. Because millions and millions and millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people are dying from the consequences of the idea you can have sex without consequences. And every one of us who has perpetuated that idea in thought or just in conviction, let alone action, is part of that genocide.
yes, it didn't kill you. <laughs> well, that's terribly important, isn't it? Well, it's, yes, it's kind of important. But if you say, well, it didn't kill me, but it's killing maybe 100 million in Africa, <laughs> you simply are saying my neighbor's life is not as important as mine. My life is sacred, but his isn't. And it's absolutely astonishing how we, and I don't just mean non-Christians, I mean Christians as well, have sold ourselves on the fact that this is a little archaic and not nearly as serious. And so I cannot believe the second generation kids growing up in missions that have premarital sex. We are failing. <laughs> even in the most intense environments of so-called religious nurturing or Christian nurturing, we are, we are failing to convey that sex, there is no sex without consequences, and sex outside of monogamy is genocide. It is genocide. God is not going... Well, yeah, don't murder, and I'm going to take this pleasure too. If my life has value, my body has value. I can't live my life without my body. <laughs> and if you want to kill yourself prematurely, the best way to do it is to have lots of sex with random partners. And you can take so many people with you. You don't have a smoking gun. <laughs> we'll leave that thought there. We call ourselves the age of science. <laughs> I don't think so. I think we love mythology just as much as any generation ever has, any age ever has. Because the myth around Sexuality is unbelievable, unbelievable, and it is bought across the world. And, well, let's just say God had it right in the first place. I had to have a t-shirt idea. Two people have made it for me, but they haven't done it exactly right, but we're getting closer. On the front of my t-shirt, it says, save the human race. And on the back of my t-shirt, it says, stop screwing everybody. And then it gives the statistics for death by AIDS, number of people that have AIDS. 80% um, of blindness comes from venereal disease in the mother, you know, and syphilis and gonorrhea and da, da, da. And it just gives the statistics down this list down my back. And then at the bottom it says, and don't forget the whales. Huh? Okay, so on the front it says, save the human race. When you turn around it says, stop screwing everybody. And then it gives the statistics of all the deaths and illnesses and destruction from sexually communicated diseases. So AIDS, millions, hundreds of millions. Gonorrhea, syphilis, all those. 80% of all blindness is from... Uh, a uh, transmittable disease in the birth canal of the mother. So we could eliminate blindness. Incest, we wouldn't have any if we'd lived monogamously. Uh, pedophilia, we wouldn't have any if we'd lived monogamously. Um, sex slavery, we wouldn't have any if we lived monogamously. Prostitution, we wouldn't have any if we lived monogamously. And how many Christians do you think are out there in the field fighting for, for children to be freed from slack slavery that, that are still living with a, a condescending attitude, if not actively engaging in sex outside of marriage? See, that's like being pro-life while hating your own. You're giving lip service to the kingdom of God, but your heart is still in the world.
the bottom of the t-shirt says, and don't forget the whales, or the polar bears, or the seal babies. A great white shark ate a guy in my neighborhood this last week. So I'm having trouble loving the sharks, but I suppose I'm supposed to. Okay. Thou shalt not steal. Okay. If I have, if you have value, I have value. If my life has value, my body has value. Now you do this one. What is God trying to give us when he says, don't steal? Yes, but you have, you have given me the literal definition. You haven't dropped to a value or meaning level. So he said respect for private property. Yes, but we went horizontal. Go vertical. Okay, what it took for you to get it and attain it? The fact that we should be satisfied with God in our lives and not need something else so desperately that we steal. Yeah, but you're going horizontally. You're not wrong, but I'm trying to drop to a meaning, a level, value level. Okay, uh, if I have property, that means that I have, have to pass by some sort of effort to get in to have it with me. Mm -hmm. Then if, if I steal, you know, that person's effort of having all the things that I'm respecting him as a human being mm -hmm. on, on, on... Very good, very good. You guys are real close. I'm going to come to you. Did you have your hand up? Okay. Yep, you're adding, adding to that. Okay, if my life has value, your life has value. If my life has value, my time has value. If I have value and my time has value, my work has value. If my work has value and my time has value, I should be remunerated for my work. And it is my time and my life, therefore my money. And therefore what I do with my money is an extension of my value. So if you can steal from me, you're saying one of two things. Your work doesn't make any difference. That you spent your life, I can always tell in YWAM bases who's ever owned their own home, <laughs> which is not many, unfortunately. Because when you haven't owned your own home, you don't realize what everything costs. You know, when you've owned your own home, and especially when you get my age, you are hoping, you are hoping this is the last microwave you will ever buy. You know, because every time that silly thing broke down in the last 60 years, that was an amount of money you couldn't buy something else with. And so, so you say, okay, I hope, this, I hope this lasts the rest of my life. I won't have to make this expenditure again. And that's why old people have so much more in an economy that flourishes, because they've worked so much longer. <laughs> okay, but people have never owned anything come in and just, they just trash it. I would never buy a YWAM vehicle. Absolutely. I would buy a car off the street in India before I'd buy a car off a YWAM base. Because of the way it's been treated. Why? Because we don't know its value. Because we don't equate its value to someone's work. You say, well, no one at the base worked for it. It was a donor. Yeah, but he worked for it. And so we think, we're so spiritual, we think we can value life outside of a material world. <laughs> you can't. If you value life, you value the material world. You take care of stuff. Why? Because it took hard work to get it. 
We don't worship stuff. We use stuff. Okay, or the other thing you could be saying, besides, you know, stealing my stuff because my life doesn't have any value, is the other reason is you may not think your work has any value. You know, if you, if you study crime a little bit, you know, high crime, not petty crime, they're ingenious. They're brilliant people. Why do they steal? They don't have a place in society as far as they're concerned. They don't have value. They're going to live on the fringes. Now, what got them there? I don't know. But it's because they don't know who they are in God. They could make a lot more money if they would just use their giftings in that way. But somehow, it doesn't connect. Okay, so now here's what you need to know. Three quarters of the world's cultures have no indigenous concept of private ownership. Now let me tell you where those cultures are. All of Asia, all of South America, and all of Africa. I think you'd have to put most of Central America in there as well. Now, what do you, I wish we had a map, but it's okay. We can imagine the map. What can you tell me about those areas of the world compared to the ones I didn't name? Mostly south of the equator. Good. Yeah. Not traditionally Christian worldview. Not traditionally Christian worldview. Also true, although not true of South America. I mean, it shouldn't be true of South America. It is. They are the poor nations of the world, almost entirely. That's why we're puzzled by Haiti. <laughs> How'd that sneak up above that? They're poor. They're not poor because they are stupid people. They're not poor because their land won't produce anything. They are poor because of how they think about property and work. And until we change the thinking, we won't change the poverty. If there is no private ownership, there is no stealing. If everything is owned communally, mi casa y su casa, my house is your house, then I can't possibly misuse your house. It's my house. And it is, it is understood anywhere in South America and Central America that if you leave something out, it's because you want to share it. Whoa, I really need a phone. And it would be perfectly acceptable, not necessarily wanted or liked, for me to just slip that in my pocket and take it home. In, in other places, if I compliment you on something, nice watch. You are obligated to offer it to me. <laughs> okay, so here we go off with our different culture. I don't know if you have a different culture. If you're from the West, you do. Uh, if you're a Christian from the non-West, you may not. See, because we don't touch these things in discipleship. We just laid Jesus over our existing cultural value of property. So, South American Christians would consider that being generous. That's not generosity in the kingdom of God. Generosity in the kingdom of God is, I own it, it's mine, I can do what I want to with it, and what I want to do with it is I want to give it to you. If there's no act of will in the exchange, in the kingdom of God, it's theft. If I have to do it, it's not generosity. Okay, so we'll come back to this. But if I have value, my time has value. If I, my time has value, my work has value. If my work and time and I have value, the stuff I do with what I made when I worked has value. It's mine. 
And in Africa, they say to me, well, how do we keep from being greedy? So because if you can't own anything, you can't be greedy. Well, that's a, fair, that's a fair observation. But if you can't own anything, you also can never be generous. And it, it's, a, it's a dilemma. God, we, God puts us in a position where we have to deal with sin. And greed is one of those sins. And one of the things we have to conquer. Greed ultimately destroys an economy. And you can see that in the United States. We're just tearing our service apart from inside. Using... The wealth that God gave us through his principles in the last 50 years ignored and thrown out the window to be replaced by no social conscience, and I get all I can possibly make as quickly as I can. And we're going to be, I've said for 20 years, we'll be a third world country in the next century. We'll be a second world country in my lifetime, and I think we're well on our way. Unless there's true repentance coming out of this latest, economic tsunami. Nine. Bear false witness. Otherwise lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Okay. Little, little more abstract than steal. What's the value here? What's the meaning of this? I know it means don't lie. That's horizontal. Thank you very much. I'll do that for you. You want to try? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, depending on the situation, you may be actually stealing. If it's a contract, if it's in court, you may be stealing their right to not be convicted. So, okay, a little bit. In terms of, of my neighbor's value, what I see is that it's mostly more or less the same as in murdering. I am believing that he has no value, therefore. I am saying false things about the person. Yeah. And if you believe he has no value, what do you believe about yourself? You have no value. And if you have no value, what about your words? Doesn't make any difference. But if God is real, you're real. The material world is real. If you're real and the material world is real, you either saw it or you didn't see it. You either said it or you didn't say it. You either signed the contract or you didn't sign the contract. And and false testimony is saying anything other than what really happened. Now, oh dear, three quarters of the world's cultures have no concrete value of words. And neither do the postmoderns. So in Africa, I will tell you what you want to hear. Because you want to hear it, and I want to be kind. South America, very similar, huh? I'll tell you whatever keeps the harmony going, very Brazilian. Whatever makes us feel good and keeps the music flowing. Japan has their word for height. Yes means 60% yes, 40% no. It is, it is the, the language is constructed to appear to say one thing while saying another. For the Muslim world, the individual has no value. There is no reality outside of whatever God does. So even if I saw it, it may not have happened. And even if I didn't hear it, I might have heard it, inshallah. And so I could never know what is real, and so I just give an answer. <laughs> so it was so fun in the Iraq war to see the, to see the uh, minister of the interior standing in front of a camera, news camera, and there's a big picture window behind him, and he is saying, 
There, there is no military incursion taking place in Iraq. And as he says it, a tank drives by behind him. <laughs> and if you come from one part of the world, you look at that and go, how can he do that? Say, but you have to understand, if you can say that, how could he do that? You have already been discipled to some level in the meaning of the value of our words. Three quarters of the world is not. The biggest difference between Jews and Arabs is if the Jews say it, they mean it, and they'll do it. When an Arab says it, you, you never know what it means. Not because they're bad guys. This is a cultural value. And that value drops to they can do nothing. Only Allah can ordain what happens. So they always say inshallah and whatever you wanted them to say. Which means I have no idea. <laughs> How trapped is that? No right of ownership. No value of time. No value of our words. Now, the postmoderns say, well, that was true to you. It's not true to me. <laughs> Welcome to pagan thinking. You see, without a value of your words, there is no intimacy. Without value to, the wor to your words, there is no contract. Without value to your words, there is no guilt or innocence in court. You say, you, you watch somebody being tried in another country, and you go, why, why don't they give them a, a, a defense lawyer? Why don't they have someone to speak for them? Because their system of justice has nothing to do with testimony and truth. They don't need any witnesses to prove you guilty. If they think you're guilty, you're guilty. Well, that's postmodernism. Welcome to bringing it all the way back around. See, you cannot build a quality of life on a culture that does not value the individual, does not value their material ownership, and does not value their words. Now, you can't value other people's words if you don't value your own. What comes out of your mouth reveals the heart. Otherwise, if you talk, you will reveal what you believe. If I ask you what you believe, you will tell me what you think think you should believe. But if you just talk without a sense of implications, you will tell me what you actually believe. Just like children do. You, know, you, you get the two-year-old or the three-year-old that walks in and goes, I didn't just break the window downstairs. <laughs> you know, they can't help it. Okay, number 10 then is covet. Do not covet. And I love the list here. Your neighbor's house, oh, well, that hasn't changed, has it? <laughs> and not covet your neighbor's wife. Oh, well, gosh, that hasn't changed either. Most of television's uh, serials are about this. <laughs> Do not covet your neighbor's male or female slave. Now, this is the work, the workers. Slaves, scripture doesn't condone slavery in the sense that we use the word. This is indentured workers who have given seven years of their life to pay for a debt. A, 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 what's the word I want? Supporting the value that your time is an asset. Your, their ox or donkey, I figure that's a BMW and an Audi. Mercedes, maybe. 
I don't know. I don't know if the donkey's a Mercedes, you think? Low maintenance. <laughs> or anything else. Do not covet. Okay, when covet means I don't want to be like you. I want what you have. What is that, what is God trying to give us? When we see that we want what somebody else has, what are we missing inside of ourselves? At a value level, what does that say about me? Okay, one motivation will be I just want to skip ahead in time and steal your stuff. Okay, now we could drop that another level. What would that mean about me? Or I have more, my time has more value than yours. It's one or the other. We steal for two reasons. We covet for two reasons. We're more valuable than anyone else. Or we, have no, we don't have as much value as anyone else. They are the flip side of the same coin. I don't believe God is telling me the truth. Or I don't know God. Okay? So if I believe who I am in God, if I see something, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working my way towards the Apple tablet, which may come out in two weeks' time. <clears throat> And I've already decided to give up the iPhone for the tablet because the tablet, I think, will be a great teaching tool. And it also does all the other stuff. So I bought a cheaper Mac because my iMac was dying this year. I bought the little mini Mac and brought it back and got a cheaper screen, saved myself about 700 bucks so that when the tablet comes out, and I'm working my way towards the tablet. And I assume... If God is really in this, I will be able to do this at some point. Maybe not early, but then maybe the first generation is not that good. Maybe God wants me to wait for the bucks to be worked out. But I'm, I'm sure that God and I are in this together, that I have to do my part, saving money, putting stuff aside. It's okay for me to dream because I, it, it will facilitate the work greatly. Um, and I'm not worried about it if I don't get it. But it's fun to plan towards it and think towards it, and I don't need yours, although it's very nice. I think just all your stuff is good. <laughs> Samsung has longer battery life, but that's okay. Six hours. Yeah, it's pretty good. I wouldn't work longer than that anyway. Do you see? So the grossness of the action is nothing to compare to what doing that means about you. And that's what God's trying to get across. In all of the law, God's trying to get across. If you can't see why this is important, you don't know who you are. You don't know how important you are. You don't realize your words impact the cosmos. Words never leave the galaxy. Words are eternal. If you could come into this room tomorrow with a sensitive enough microphone, and they exist for, for this, and you could pick up the sound waves of my voice in this room. Because in 24 hours, they'll still be bouncing around. Now, when they finally get an opening and bounce out of the room, they just keep going until they run into something, bounce back. And so they're out there in the universe. Perm the universe is a recordable digital drive. Sin culminated in tilting the planet. 
That's how powerful our words and our actions are. We are second only to God in authority in the cosmos. We're not anywhere near the authority God has, but compared to anything else, including demons and angels, we have infinitely more authority. And whether we know it or not, when we use it, it does something to everything, including ourselves. And so literally what God is wanting from the human race is for them to be able to go, I am just too valuable to kill you. <laughs> because if I am that valuable and I am that valuable, then you have to be that valuable too. And yeah, I think it's a stupid idea, but that's what God says and I believe it. Therefore, I'm simply too valuable to steal. You're too valuable to steal from. I'm, I'm too real. I'm too powerful to lie. I, I have to tell the truth. There is a truth. Truth can be known, and my words must match it. And then one culture goes, oh, yeah, but that's going to offend a lot of people. I know. Conflict is part of reality. And now you're going, oh, does that mean I have to be like an American? No, you can have conflict in an Asian way. You can have conflict in a South American way. You can have conflict in a Chinese way. But conflict you must have if you are real, if God is real, and if life is of value. Do I have to be a husband like Americans are husbands? No. You have to learn to do that within the cultural context, but you have to be a husband who is committed to serving his wife, not the other way around. She is your first priority in all things. Not your children, not your parents. That offends my culture. Oh, gosh, we've only started to offend your culture. The Bible offends everybody's culture. Believe you me, it walks right over my American toes and just stamps on every one of them. And God says, I don't care. See, because you can't be so culturally sensitive that you're willing to live a lie. God loves the cultures. But redeeming them does not mean leaving them lost in their understanding of reality. Redeeming them means bringing them into an understanding of reality and then finding a cultural way to express it because diversity is what God loves. He doesn't want cookie cutters. And that's what we're trying to do with business. We're trying to look at the cultural values that keep people poor. We're trying to look at the biblical values that assure us we can eliminate poverty, and we're trying to find a way to live those values so we can be a part of accomplishing that. Okay.